This is the Golden Hour Podcast, brought to you by the Polar Pro Studio, hosted by David Mays. Today's guest is me, Farouk, from iPhone And today we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff about cameras, about phones, about YouTube and TikTok. But the question is, <laughs> is this podcast any good? Yes, thank you so much for that epic intro. Holy cow. So we met back on uh, the first and I guess only time we've ever met in person was at the what the Sony A6400 event going to Catalina, I yes. believe. I was thinking about that. I was like, was it A6400 or A6600? But it was one of those that flipped upwards. Yeah, it was the 400. That was the first time that ever happened. Uh, that was the first time they started kind of making cameras that we wanted, you know, having a selfie yeah. screen on it. You know, everybody was like, come on, give us a flip screen, Sony. So that was yeah. pretty exciting. That was a great it trip. Was. It was a great trip. And I remember you making um, magic tricks on the way yep. while we were on the boat. <laughs> It was a lot of entertainment going on. It was great, yes. actually, now that you think about it, you know. I know, it, especially with how things are now, like to think about those times, It was. It's. Uh, I think of them fondly. I miss the interactions with other creators and just being around each other. Hopefully things will start happening again and camera companies will maybe do those types of events again. That'd be awesome. I cannot wait. Before I was a YouTuber, I actually watched your content and was aware of, of your channel and have always been a fan of the kind of rock and roll uh, aesthetic and the rock and roll music that you've <laughs> also done in there. We could talk about that because I'm a guitar player. I don't know if you knew that. but Oh, nice. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I just love your your channel and your style and the fact that you're this guy in Hollywood, essentially, who is doing this tech channel and has this like amazing accent. You're doing rock music. It's like, <laughs> tell me about yourself. Like, how did you get started and where do you come from originally? And like, how did this all come to be with this iPhone do um, thing that everybody loves? Uh, thank you so much. First of all, yeah. Thank you so much for all the uh, kind words. <laughs> of course. Uh, it, it all, it all. I was always very curious about technology and I was, as soon as the internet started shaping, as soon as we had the GeoCities websites back then, um, this all started happening together. And I think car phones and then the first cell phones, I started writing left and right about my experiences and slowly it started getting bigger. But back then... It was interesting because we didn't have like a like a channel name or anything. We had websites. <clears throat> Sorry. So I had a website for um, Sony Ericsson. I had a w website for Ni uh, Nokia. So the names were um, getting established like that. And when iPhone came out, I was in Turkey, and I had I put together this website where you can learn about how to use your phone, how to do stuff, what the error codes means, what a bootloader is, you know, what you, how you need to do it. And if you don't want to do it, you can send your phone to me. I would do it for, I don't know, $50 or something back then. I don't remember. As a side <laughs> income, and I'll send it back to you. So that's how it started. The name iPhone that came from there. And back then I had yeah. the so Sony Ericsson, Nokia, and I was all uh, mm -hmm. very active on the forums. It all began like that. And I was uploading to um, Google video. I didn't even care about oh, YouTube wow. video because I didn't care about video at that stage to be viewed by others than the clients I would have. <clears throat> but then something happened. Um, I think this was after I moved here. I uploaded a video just to make fun of unboxing videos because I thought, the pure unboxing video where there's nothing other than unboxing happening <laughs> in the video. I thought uh -huh. they were the dumbest shit ever. Like, <laughs> why would anyone? So I made a video for 13 minutes straight, a MacBook Pro under my hand, and I'm mm -hmm. saying I'm going to unbox this. And I didn't unbox it at all. <laughs> I just milked it for 13 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and remember back then we were able to put like hidden links and stuff like that in YouTube. 
And yeah. I put one hidden link. If you're lucky enough to catch that, you would click on it and I find just, it's just a laptop in the box. Uh-huh. And <laughs> I got a lot of backlash. This was of all course. in Turkish. <clears throat> but okay, a lot of people laughed. Yeah. So when when they were laughing with me, I realized, dude, we're on to something. This this has yeah. to, I have to do this more. So that's how it began. It's all the the zany, the the comical side. It all comes from there because I find it's. We just talk about technology. We're not we're not developing technology. We don't need to be that serious about like we can relax <laughs> and have fun, right? Totally, totally. Yeah, so that's how it began. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. And I, I, I was looking at your channel as you're saying this, trying to find that video. Is it still available on your on your account? Can you see I it? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So yeah, maybe I can I can try to find it and put it in the show notes. Um, I would love to see it. We won't maybe be able to understand it because it's in a different language, but that's what subtitles are for, right? So. You'll you'll understand that it's not getting unboxed at all. Yeah, that's amazing. So tell me about yourself and the Turkey Hollywood uh, journey. Like what led you to Los Angeles and how did you end up there? So uh, I wanted to release an album. I was into music quite a lot. So I want to release an album. But back then, releasing an album was a big deal. You need to get, you know, a record deal. And then, and then you know, it was a lot of work and no one was really caring about my music and that led me to create a home studio where I can record everything myself so I started playing all the instruments I learned how to program drums and then I put together demo albums I was sending them out no one was listening no one cared Mm. I was entering music (laughs) competitions naively (laughs) not naively back then I didn't know what music competitions, you know, really are made for. I was like, yeah, maybe I'll win. I had no idea. It's promotion for a band that is already decided. So, <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> uh, and then um, I decided to come to the music school here in L.A. And my sister lives here. Uh, she's been living here a lot longer than me. Uh, so I... One day I, I decided to leave and I called my mom. I, and I was thinking this is going to be really sad. Like, mom, I want to go. I want to go to music school in the U.S. I thought she was going to be like, oh, my son. No, you should keep on cr- grinding. You should. Tr-. She was like, okay. Okay, I'm going <laughs> to find someone <laughs> to buy your furniture. I'm going to uh-huh. rent your house. You're in six months. Dude, oh, six wow. months. She kicked me out of Turkey in six months. I was here. I was like, wait, I wasn't ready. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know. That's amazing. So yeah, I came here and then went to language school um, for a while to, you know, because I was able to speak English. I was able to read and understand English. But um, when it comes to other people talking to me, I had no idea what was going on. So I went to the language school a little bit and then switched from there to the music school and then and then I and then I got the green card with the lottery and I'm like well well I'm not going back <laughs> that's amazing yeah that's crazy yeah I, I don't know if you've ever done like a tell all uh, on your channel kind of explaining that but that's the first time I've I've heard your story I, ha- uh, I haven't most people uh, don't even know where the I found the name comes from I yeah I'm planning to do it actually this year I want to do a lot more uh, how we work with companies, how we work with sponsors, what is a sponsored content, how we review stuff, what happens when we re- after we review stuff. Like there was there are a couple of products that they changed after I reviewed it, right? So one year later, a guy buys the same product, and some people watch the reviews to validate themselves to hear how what a great choice they made (laughs) a lot of people do that i do that myself (laughs) (laughs) so they come and watch my video and i'm like yeah this doesn't work this app constantly crashes and they get furious oh and then it's like can you see that that video is posted a year ago 
can you put two and two together and maybe realize they fixed it in a year? So yeah, I want to make much more conversational videos now. I feel like I got too much beauty shots. I got lost in that a lot, which which is what I enjoy well, a lot. Well, yeah, I, I definitely want to talk about your beauty shots because I think that's something that a lot of people know you as, is the epic intro guy with the <laughs> amazing voiceover. In fact, maybe at the end of this show, I'll have you record the intro to this show instead of my lousy intro. This. Oh, is the Golden Hour podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Gladly. But um, again, so I, I want to go back to, I'm just fascinated by your story personally. So you, you come to LA, you go to the music school. Where does YouTube fit in? Were you doing the iPhone Do thing already uh, on the blog but during the music uh, yeah, this LA is, thing? This is where it happened. When I was in the school, I did that unboxing video. And then yeah. there was iPhone 3GS release. Mm -hmm. And I went to the Apple store and there was there was a line in front of the store and coming from <laughs> Turkey, I was like, there's there's a line. Yeah. People are like people are buying this phone, like there's a line as if they give out give out food here. <laughs> and the next thing you know, I'm in the iPad line, by the way. A couple of years later. <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of I, I'm thankful that uh their online system is pretty good these days, but uh, there was something fun about going to the store and spending the night and meeting all these crazy outcasts that like stand in line to buy Apple products. <laughs> That's very true. Being in the line is not about being in the line. It's being with people like you there. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. And then Apple comes out, they they bring you food, they bring you drinks. <laughs> yeah. It's It's an event. I remember going there like five in the morning and stuff like that. And it has always been... A funny one. This is good too. They give you a time slot and then you go there, you pick up your phone. It's a little robotic maybe. Yeah. But yeah. Effic it's efficient. It's a very Tim Cook uh, it's way of true, doing yeah. things. <laughs> <laughs> but um, okay, so you're kind of doing things at the same time. And, and I think maybe that's when I discovered your content. Um, I don't know. You were, you were doing tech stuff and I, I'd watch it. You do camera reviews. You would do uh, mobile phone reviews. And you, I remember, I don't, I don't even know exactly what I'm thinking, but I just remember a while ago before I did YouTube, maybe four or five years ago, you were infusing your music into your stuff. I, I know you still do, but every mm -hmm. once in a while you would like cut to like a vlog sequence and then underneath would be like a song that you wrote or something. And I always thought that was so fascinating that you were kind of blending the two. Was that a strategy that you were doing or was that just a way for you to kind of express yourself through music? Uh, with the videos i think that was before i uh started trusting the epidemic sound <laughs> this is, okay. that's what i'm using now <laughs> I love we're it, not yeah. sponsored or anything i don't know are we no we're not um do you, but do I a, use, uh, you don't have an you, affiliate link for them no actually i just i just started using it and and it's good oh, cool. it's, so before them i know that youtube is really weird and whenever a big YouTuber does something terrible, all the bad things, all the bad outcome happens to smaller channels like us. Like I'm talking about the top guys. They go and do something controversial and then we, we pay for it. We have to go and click like, no, there are no kids in my video. No, this is not for kids. No, this like, it's There's really- no language in this. Yeah. 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 Um, so we're paying the price for all of that stuff. And I, I was always thinking the songs are going to come back and haunt me. So, so I got to prepare my own songs. And back then, it wasn't this busy, was it? I don't remember. I, I remember sparing maybe like two, three weeks and just working on, I don't know, a song and then just release that song for fun. But now it's like, oh, this camera is coming out. That phone is coming out. This is coming <laughs> out. Know. Oh, no, there are NDAs here. Put that product back into this box so you don't, they don't yeah. see it behind you, you know. Yes. Yeah. Now it's <laughs> exactly. crazy. And I cannot complain, but it is a different beast right now. So I feel mm. like now I don't have a lot of time to write songs. But this year, I had it last year and the year, year before that. Uh, I had the burnout because of the pandemic and everything this year i want to have i want to have a lot of fun on the channel because 
I felt like my channel is not mine anymore. This is, I felt like the competition within myself reached a level where, where I'm like, okay, now I have to spend two months for, you know, calm down, just turn on the camera, just say whatever you feel about the product. You don't have to film every single thing to have it in the B-roll. Yeah, exactly. It was, <laughs> yeah, I, I felt like I lost my mind. But it is all that uh, thing that where you're trying to show that you know how this thing works. And that's the problem with the products we review. Now the products are so good that they are as good as the person who's using it, right? So you you can take a camera and I know you will use that camera to the max. I will use that camera to the max, but someone else may not. So they come and they watch your video and they look at the same camera they have. They're like, this doesn't take photos like that. Yeah. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you can't, you can't. I'm showing it to you. Yeah. So <laughs> it is really weird. You want to close all those doors so people can ask them, ask themselves that question, but. You know. Totally. Yeah. I, and um, it's it's a strange thing being in our niche too, because it's it's kind of uh, we're making reviews about products that are used in filmmaking and, and storytelling and, and stuff and, you know, commercial projects. And we're just kind of making YouTube videos. So it's kind of, uh, you know, like Armando has done a good job of like every once in a while he'll do a short film or whatever. And certain people do that. But then it, it's hard to replicate that month over month over month when there's new products coming out every single week, basically. And then you, you have Gerald who's got his format, you know, in his studio. And I just love your format and the fact that you've been able to keep it interesting by having a wonderful set um, with, with great tests that you do in your studio. But then you also get out and you go to the beach and you go outside and film stuff out on the street. How have you been able to kind of balance all these different things with the fact that you're you're talking about cameras and tools that are used in a creative way how do you stay creative when it's kind of become almost like a machine that you're having to crank these videos out so regularly i feel like in time you start narrowing a format to the product if it's a gimbal we will go running and we will do the rocky test if it's a camera it usually starts in uh, venice beach that kind of um, template happens by itself for the products. So, and then you can you start playing around with those things. I I feel like sometimes it's re repetitive to go and you know film a skateboarder for every camera review, but for me it gives me a great idea about the differences between the previous camera and the same camera because I'm doing the same thing. So if it's a lot easier with a camera, for example, when I when I reviewed Hasselblad, Hasselblad is not a sports camera. To, to be able to capture that skateboarder in focus, I had to set it to manual focus, guess where the focus is going to be. No one listens to you because, you know, this is not, uh, <laughs> they're not working with you. They're just skating over there. And you got to capture the photo. So that's a different experience. And then you go with the Sony camera and everything is focused all the time. So you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> then, then you yeah, they're doing, happen to have They're doing have tricks and their eye is perfectly in focus every time. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. I don't know how yeah. they do it. It's crazy. Yeah, so it happens though. These okay. templates happen by itself and then you start having fun with it. That's awesome. So when did it kind of click in for you with the channel that you were like, okay, this is actually potentially a way to make money and to become like a job. Cause again, you're, you moved to LA to do music. You went to the school, like whatever happened with the school. Did you graduate? Did, did you do any production or anything? And then I did graduate. Did the but the funny thing is in school, I brought my camera one day mm -hmm. and little did I know I am in a classroom of singers and everyone needs headshots, including the teachers. <laughs> okay. So I ended up doing headshots for everyone. And then I was going to a gym and people at the gym, the trainers needed headshots. They heard about the 
so suddenly I graduated from music school, but I was doing photography. And then our friends started getting married. So I started shooting weddings. And then that kind of took off. And, and one day, a friend of mine uh, said, he sent me everything Apple Pro's um, footage where he unlocks all the iPhones with one finger. He said, you see this? I think if you switch to English, um, all the people, all the global audience can see your videos. I think this was 2014. And that made a lot of sense. But switching to English is really difficult. Back then, I was going to the YouTube studio in Marina del Rey to film stuff over there. And you got to, you had to have certain amount of subscribers to be able to access their place. There were a lot of things. So one day, I switched my channel from Turkish to English because I had no other choice. I didn't have any choice to start a new channel and wait for it to grow up and stuff like that. And so people started un unsubscribing like crazy, but global people started subscribing like crazy. So my subscriber <laughs> number started going up, but it was like <laughs> the unsubscribers and subscribers were crazy. It was changing a lot. And crazy. the income from YouTube, oh my God, it jumped like crazy. Oh, yeah. It jumped like crazy. I had no idea. Back then, while it was in Turkish, every three months, maybe you'll buy yourself a phone case with the YouTube income. <laughs> 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 and suddenly I was like, holy, what's going on? We can make a living like this. So. It yeah. started going like that, and I closed all the doors to the subscribers and everything and everything. But then when the controversy started to happen, when YouTube started like, yeah, we're going to cut it from here a little bit. We're going to cut it from there a little bit. I'm like, sure, okay, sponsors, <laughs> come on, let's do this. <laughs> okay, so, so like once you switched to English, you started seeing some growth. And then was that the point where you're like, dang, I can make a living out of this. And you started treating it very seriously at that point? Absolutely, yeah. Also, before cool. that, I was anonymous. While, I was in, while I, it was in Turkish, I was anonymous, which if you're planning to open up a channel or do anything online anonymously, listen to me. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't plan for it. Believe me. Anonymously? What do you mean by that? So I never showed my face. All of my videos were like this oh, okay. area. Yeah. And but that was a joke. That was that was a joke slash a Turkish cultural thing where you don't show off your wealth. And since I was buying these products myself, it's it's a way of showing your wealth. So it's that's okay. That's not cool. So I didn't want to put a face into it. <laughs> I wanted it to be yeah. A lot of YouTubers could learn from that. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted it to be about the product, but not about me. Sure. Um, but and they discovered you... who I am because you okay. know, your mom is online, your sister is online, your wife is online. <laughs> sure. And we're taking photos. Someone so, posts this. Yeah. So you switched it to English and you just went ahead and included your face. Yeah, <laughs> and revealed really myself. I did an unboxing of my head. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's true. Is that true? You had a box yeah, over true. your head? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to find that video. That's incredible. I think it's um, Hello World. Okay. It's called Hello World. Hello World on iPhone. And it's iPhone Do, right? Not yeah. Do. Yeah. iPhone Do, like Taekwondo. Yeah. <laughs> Although everybody, I'm sure everybody calls it iPhone do. That's yeah. a constant. Yeah, I get I I'm get sure. that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it started working. How did you get the how did you get the stuff at the at the beginning? Did you buy it and then return it? Did did you have friends that would let you loan like borrow stuff? That's, did you yeah. rent cameras? How did it work for you when you started out? So in the in the very beginning I was buying all the stuff and I was cre I was updating to every iPhone. I had two lines because back then we used to have we had to have phone lines to be able to upgrade every year. Otherwise it was every two years or you pay a lot. You pay the full That's price. True. So I had two lines and one year apart from each other. So I was updating with that. And I was buying all of the products, or my friends were coming, they were buying the products for themselves before they go back to Turkey or my parents were doing, or it was things that I was buying for 
my friends that 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 are gonna you know stop by LA and then go somewhere. So that's that's how it happened. At what point did did people start kind of reaching out? Was was that a couple of years in, or I guess at that time there really wasn't a a real precedent for a lot of these companies to give you stuff in advance that really wasn't happening seven years ago or five years ago but um yeah I no mean, there was no such thing and and in the beginning it was just phone cases and stuff like that like yeah who, who cares but then they would send you all the clip i think sent me a lens or something mm-hmm. and then um i had a steadicam smoothie Yes, oh, yeah, I remember that. Steadicam smoothie. <laughs> so an a- I remember that. agency sends Steadicam smoothie and I was mind blown. Steadicam <laughs> smoothie came, I made the video and uh-huh. I wrote them an email. Of course, like they had no say in the video, nothing. They just sent the product and that was it. Yeah. And and no one's asking back for the products. I'm like, what's going on? No one's asking back. <laughs> <laughs> oh my I was gosh. so mind blown. Yeah, Steadicam yeah. smoothie seven years ago. I just searched it here. Uh, seven years ago, CC in English. So I, yeah. I wonder. If, so yeah, that's wonder, that's me testing the waters, the global waters, <laughs> the global waters. But your head isn't in it here at, on this one. This is a chopped off head version. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh wow, that's so interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's a cultural thing. So, uh, did you have any filmmaking like background or anything? Did you just kind of stumble into all this? Uh, as a, like all in the amateur level, my grandfather was huge in photography. So my father also, we had the dark rooms and stuff like that in the, in our houses. So it was always in the blood. And, and I used to make um, short movies and stuff like that, but all super amateur, like point the camera somewhere, stand there, pause the camera, move <laughs> out, keep on filming. And like, oh, he disappeared. You know, th- that lame stuff. Totally. And yeah. now here we are. <laughs> now here we are shooting on 8K and all sorts of crazy things. <laughs> it's pretty fun. Um, <clears throat> cool. Okay. I think I got a good kind of history there. I am curious. How were you making money? Did you have a job while you were doing all this as well? Or how did that work? Yeah. Yes, I was doing the photography. That's how, okay. that's how things were going. I was doing the headshots and videography. Oh, wow. okay. I was doing uh, graphic work. That's that's how it was going. Gotcha. Lo- logos, you know. And yeah. I mean, I guess you're all, all. Is LA the only place you've lived in America? Did you live in any yes. other states? No. Okay. No, I haven't. Yeah. So I guess you don't really realize it. Maybe how? Uh, I mean, I'm sure you do re- realize now, but. I think the fact that you are in the heart of LA and, and Hollywood and there's so many other creators there, there's such a, I got to be a part of this myself for the four years that I lived there and I miss it. There's an electricity to the environment of living in LA. And obviously if you're listening to this podcast and you don't live there, I'm sorry. Uh, but like it's, <laughs> but it's there's true. something special about it. It's true. Like you, you meet other creators and you had access to the YouTube studio, like the, the physical YouTube studio, not the, we all have access to the YouTube studio on the website. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, it's really special. I mean, have you been able to kind of realize that over the years, like how kind of blessed we are to be able to have access to Los Angeles and stuff like that? I'm still mind blown. <laughs> it's mind blowing. Yeah, the energy is really high. Everyone's you go out there, you see people filming, you see skateboarders being filmed. There's there's a movie shoot happening somewhere and everyone is constantly about creativity. So it's it's a lot of fun to be here. And yeah, also I want to add to that YouTube studio thing that we have a physical YouTube studio. And if they haven't changed the rules, if you have more than 100,000 views, uh, subscribers, they open their doors for you. You go there and then they do this sort of um, orientation. And after that, you can take any camera, (laughs) any light, anything you can imagine from their inventory and go rent one of their studios and shoot whatever you want. Of course, they need to approve it later. 
And also back then, I don't know if they still do it. They had pre-prepared sets, like a set. So let's say it's Halloween time. They had a set for, I don't know, a scary movie. It's it's such an opportunity. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I I got to go there as well when we were with Kinetika and stuff. And it, I think it actually at the time it was only fifty thousand to get in the door because we we never even hit a hundred with Kino. But um, and yeah, it's so amazing. You have access to all these cinema cameras and lenses. You just you said rent a studio space, but renting it is basically you just saying I want this studio on this day, and then they verify it. Like if you meet the threshold as a creator they open the doors uh, for you. And even if you're a creator outside of LA and, and you want to go visit one of these studios, I think they have them all over the globe. I think there's one in London as well. I think there may be one in New York. I'm not sure. I think but, one. Yeah. Um, I think there's so, one in New York. Yeah. But it could kind of be a fun little destination if you're a creator and you haven't seen one of these studios, uh, go to one of those towns and check it out. It's pretty cool. You got to um, go and check it out. So one of the things that people are kind of probably in their minds when they think about you is, like I said, the intros, uh, the epic, this is the golden hour show, or this is the Phantom Four. And then you have these amazing sweeping slider shots and crazy lighting effects. I loved the oh, one that you. you did with the Mac Pro where it did like a spin and then there was like smoke coming out of it. It was <laughs> so cool. Um, tell me about that. Cause I, I think it's so cool that you, you've kind of branded yourself as that. Maybe it's, it's hard now because you've established yourself like that. So now you kind of have to do it for every video or like how you battle that. Um, I mean, uh, you know, it's a lot of work to do that, obviously. Um, yeah, that, that those intros take, um, days to shoot, but they, they take even longer to come up with them because literally you're sitting on the couch going, because there's so much those, um, uh, programmable motorized gimbals can do. There's so, there's so much that they can do. So you you sit there, you're like if I do this, then if I, mm, I wonder if that's possible, and then you make like a mini test shot. But even for the mini test shot, you gotta set everything up properly to know its full potential. And um, yeah, it became a part of the channel, and I'm very proud of them and I and I really enjoy them because it's all about how much a product excites me how much I want to share it with with the people because I'm not the company uh, I am a person that really loves technology bringing the news to people who think like so I feel like I'm this bridge between the product and the consumer so it's it's a really weird area and there are like little segments that's divided in between two and i feel like i am in a place where i represent what would happen if we push its limits how far can we push it and and that reflects to the entire video so the intro has to be equally exciting and there was a video for the airpods max that I used zero beauty shots, nothing in it. And that video was received really well too, which was a huge uh, <laughs> relief yeah, for one, me. Over 1.4 million views as of right now. Yeah. So, so that, that's good to know because it's all about the, the content of the video. And, and AirPods Max really had so much that we needed to talk about. Even though it's a beautiful looking headphone, um, so that fulfilled that. You don't really need to make intros to everything. But if it's a drone, I'm blown away by the design of the drones or the design of the cameras. I'm a design graduate myself, so whenever I see it, a Dyson's box, it's so interesting to me because they make it so good, so efficient and stuff like that. Dyson? So, the yeah. vacuum company? <laughs> yeah. Dude, they make crazy boxes. When you unfold it, when it's like when it's folded, uh -huh. I don't know how they cut it. It's all in the shape of the product, and then you unfold it. You know, <laughs> and it's this flat <laughs> carton thing. And I'm like, dude, how did they do this? It's so That's good. cool. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Okay, I guess there's a reason why it's expensive. I guess <laughs> that's the that's the reason. <laughs> Spending it all on the packaging. 
Do you yeah. find that from a YouTube analytics standpoint, um, do you find that those first, you know, 60 seconds of your video with those intros, does that, does that help with your like retention? Do people kind of stick around longer because you hook them at the beginning? Is that your reason for it? Or is it just kind of something that you artistically enjoy doing? It is definitely something I artistically enjoy. <laughs> and I think it is actually not really good for the video because the um, the more professional it looks, the more suspicious the audience become. And if they don't know you, if they haven't been following you, uh, I don't know if they realize a channel like my size, which is on the edge of becoming you know one of the known channels but it's also s still s so small that a lot of people don't know me uh that they feel they don't even realize where that footage is from so i don't think it really helps especially with tiktok and everything right now they just point the phone and shoot which is something i love uh but I cannot stop doing it. This is this is what gets me going. If I don't do it, then then why am I filming? Then I don't care, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now I was just wondering. Yeah, I'm, I've heard interviews with Marquez talking about how, you know, his robot camera is kind of it's he's doing similar things that you're doing with the robot, where it's like having that does differentiate you from other creators because you're putting in the work and the effort. It's just another level of kind of making it harder for other people to replicate because, you know, it's your own style. It's your own kind of thing. And so, you know, I, I also think there's almost an intangible thing about it that <clears throat> from a peer standpoint, like myself, I respect you as a peer because I love what you're doing with that. And there's many other people that agree with me on that. And then especially uh, more importantly, your uh, sponsors and, uh, companies are probably seeing the effort that you're putting into it and they recognize how valuable that is to them as a brand that may want to partner with you. So it may not give you millions and millions of views to do that, but it does establish you as, you know, a professional person that in turn helps with peers and then also future brands that you partner with. That is, that's a really good point because uh, in my, in my case, I still um, don't send the videos for anyone to check. I don't sign anything that um, that limits what I'm saying. Uh, they all trust me. And having videos like like my Karma review uh -huh. is so liberating because if a company doesn't trust their product, they don't send it to you. So. So it's such a clean conscience when you're when you're reviewing something, and and the companies know. So a company knows if you're making something up, right? If you're yeah. if, if you grab a camera, and if it's bad, and you're like, this is so good, but you're not showing any footage and stuff like that. You know, people mm -hmm. do those little shortcuts. Uh, everyone knows it. Everyone knows how this thing works. Knows it, and then they see it. So either they approach it to make stuff up for their product or yeah. they look at my my videos which is i'm super proud of this uh they're like oh yeah he will talk about i don't know the, the these problems we have and we don't want anyone's attention on it is one angle and the other angle is oh this guy will not cover the microphone with his finger and then say <laughs> the microphone is bad you know so uh -huh. you get <laughs> so in the company's eyes you reach a level of yeah this guy knows what he's doing and if he has questions he will ask you but if the product is shit, he will say it's shit, so be prepared you know <laughs> how have you f <laughs> absolutely 100 percent um how have you found uh the the best way to make money uh, as a as a creator doing this is it views are you getting good money from your cpm are you working with sponsors regularly What's your kind of business strategy for how you make a living? I'm just curious. So I, I really like the amount of money I make just from the views. It is really good. Um, it keeps everything going. But I'm in a house. I don't have any employees. 
if I stop making videos for three months just because I don't want to, it's all on me, right? If I can still pay the rent and stuff like that, then we're good. But if I have an office, if I have employees, if I have, you know, uh, stuff that I need to pay, the office is electricity bill and stuff like that, I have to work. So in that sense, I'm really free to do whatever I want. And the YouTube's income is really good. You're making uh, good money with your ad revenue. And that's a huge blessing because of our niche. The tech and camera gear niche has a really high CPM when you compare it to other niches like entertainment or gaming, especially. Um, so that's, that is a blessing that, you know, if you get into the tech niche um, and you're successful, you can actually make pretty good money off of the views. I know Marquez is making bank, you know, just off of his views, which is awesome. And it, it makes sense, right? The people who watch that type of content are going to buy maybe products that are advertised in front of those videos. Like if, if a new Samsung phone is out, they're probably going to buy a spot in front of a YouTuber to advertise the new Samsung phone. And somebody might click that link and go buy the phone, you know? So like, it makes sense why that works in that niche. What about cameras? Cause I think you and I especially could talk about cameras for hours. I don't want to, I don't want to take too much of your time. It's already been about 49 minutes. Um, are you okay on time here with the show? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, cool. I saw your wife back there, by the way, your wife, she's in the videos. How long have you guys been married now? I'm just curious. Uh, more than about well, forever. If you ask me, <laughs> <laughs> do you have kids? Do you guys have kids? No, no. Okay. We buy phones instead of kids. <laughs> <laughs> do you guys have dogs um, or animals? No. Um, we want to get two dogs eventually, but our yeah. house right now is really small and she's working endlessly. I'm working endlessly. So <laughs> does she we, work with you or does she have her own? She thing has or? her own stuff. Uh, she works with musicians. She takes care of their social media and then Very she does cool. her music on top of it. She's releasing her album this year. So she goes to the studio, does the recording and everything. We have a studio here. So she oh, wow. pre-records stuff here and then goes to the studio. But what's her name? We Her can name look is Joe, Joe Nagel, N-A-G-L-E. Great. Everybody go check it out. <clears throat> Something recently that you posted, I'm really interested in your opinion on, and that's the Nikon. I feel like it's one of the most underrated cameras of the year, the Z9. Yes. Um, what? Just give me kind of your kind of overall thoughts on it, because it you made an amazing video, as always, awesome. on it. It's, I loved it. And it's a really in-depth video, too. It's about 27 minutes. Um, great intro as always, of course, with this one. Um, but the title of your review is use it as my main camera, 8k. Mm -hmm. Um, now I don't think we're going to get a ton of clicks on, you know, talking about the Z nine necessarily. Cause it's just, unfortunately people just don't give a crap about Nikon, but the camera, I think as tech enthusiasts, it's important to recognize when something's amazing. And I think what they've done is truly amazing. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on the Z9. So Z9 is incredible. It's just, so I had Z6. <clears throat> that was good. That was Me okay. Too. It had, it had its, you know, strengths and weaknesses. It was okay. Um, nothing to complain about, but Z9, I don't know how everyone is not talking about it because it does everything and it does everything really good. Like eight, 8K, it's an 8K monster. No overheating. It's mind-blowing. It just warms up. It just warms up to a level and just stays there. Like, doesn't get hotter or colder. Doesn't matter how long you shoot. It's, I mean, maybe under the sun, of course, it will change. I'm not challenging anyone. But in the house, in this, in LA, it didn't heat up at all. It's recorded for three hours. It's insane. Nuts. Um, the, I find the, that, sorry, I was, I'm cutting you no, off, no, you off but ahead. I also use the Nikon Z6 as well. And at the time, the a7 III was kind of the king uh, at that time when the Z6 came out. And I found the Z6 to have a little bit better color science than Sony at the time. I, I now think that Sony has solved their color issues and almost all of their new cameras look great. But at the time I switched over to the Z6, I was using the 10 bit 
uh, ProRes on the Atomos, and I really enjoyed my time with it. Obviously, um, there were still some shortcomings with it, but I really loved like the handling of it. I love the the Z lenses are better than Canons, in my opinion. I think they're balanced better on the bodies. Um, they've got a great range of lenses, and the handling. Once you get to know like the 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 buttons and stuff, it's very intuitive to use it. I think they've it really. Is. Obviously, they've been around forever. Nikon is like one of the most legendary brands in the camera world. Um, so, of course, they know how to make a good camera. They do. And that's the, that's the, I used to use Nikons to do my headshots and stuff like that. So, I was very familiar. And as soon as I picked up Z6, like in, in two days, I was back dialing everything the way I wanted. And I don't know. It's just Z9 is just, it's big and heavy, right? That's the thing. It's big and heavy, but other than that, and it's expensive. It is really remarkable. It's for so, for a lot a of people. Camera. For a lot of people, it's expensive. Obviously, I mean, it's fifty five hundred dollars, and it's never in stock because of the chip shortage. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but if you're not familiar with the specs, it's a forty five megapixel uh, censored camera. It's giving you eight K up to thirty frames per second, four K one twenty, ten bit internal. Uh, it's got phase detection autofocus, so you can actually trust it for, for video autofocus. Did you mm -hmm. find that the autofocus is actually at a point now where it's reliable for video on the yeah. Z9? Yeah, there was there was no footage uh, that was out of focus. That's awesome. The only footage that was out of focus, it was my mistake, and the lens didn't have the minimum focus distance that I thought it had. Yeah. But other and than that, there was no hunting. I'm sorry, and you didn't ahead. know. I was just gonna say, and you didn't know it was out of focus because there's no flip screen on it. Like to, yes, so yes. you couldn't. You couldn't that's you why that tell. happened because you couldn't tell. Which is the only downside, in my opinion, is they they should have put a freaking uh, articulating screen on it. It's got the the one that comes out and does like a little side thing, but it's not your normal YouTuber flip screen. Unfortunately, it is not. Yeah, yeah. If you I mean, a monitor, what if they make us? What if we can like pre-order? What if we, some of us want with a flip out screen, some of us want with a tilt screen. What if we can pre-order that and they have like a, I don't know, a yeah. system that will apply that. That'd be cool if you could select, just like how when you're configuring your MacBook, if yeah. you just like flip screen, no flip screen, uh, cooling fan, no cooling fan, you know, or yeah. whatever. <laughs> oh my God, cooling fan. Put cooling fans to everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's seeming to be a trend. We got yeah. the, uh, the, the uh, what's it called? The, the FX3, we've got the potential new GH6, which rumors are showing that it has a fan. Uh, the R5C now has a fan. The S1H has a fan. We got to have fans. Yeah. <laughs> Give us fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, cool. So, yeah, everybody go check out uh, uh, Ferox, uh, uh Z9 video. It's awesome. Also, um, there's an update that we're expecting that's going to bring uh, 4K, 8K, 60 Holy cow. And, and a lot more crazy, like, I think ProRes. Mm. Did you buy one HK? yourself? Do you actually own it? Or did you no, get it, it from came, like... it came for a review and it, and it went back, sadly. Okay, so Sony and iPhone, though, are kind of synonymous in a, a lot of people's minds, probably. I mean, obviously, we just talked about the Nikon. And I don't think you're opposed to going to any other brand or reviewing other brands. But um, you really have like fallen not in love with sony but like you've you've really embraced sony cameras and the alpha system mm -hmm. um talk about about the sony cameras that you own and kind of your overall experience with sony because when you switched initially to sony things were not where they are now like the color is better the autofocus is, is better um the a6300 for me was the first one that I was like holy crap this autofocus is really good um and then as things started advancing, I mean, it just got better and better. A7S III really is kind of the ultimate camera right now. Like, I don't see any reason why um, you would need anything more than what that camera can do. I mean, it's pretty amazing. It is true. It is true. And to me, I was using, you can find this on the internet too, because it's hilarious. I was using RX100 series, started with RX104. And then actually RX102, 4, 5. And then after that, I switched to GH5. That was the big jump. And mm -hmm. then this all happened online, by the way. I jumped and people were complaining about autofocus. And I was on the other end. I was saying, learn how to use the camera. Autofocus is fine. 
<laughs> but then I started shooting because every test was instant. Do you remember those? They were like pointing at something and pointing at something else, pointing at yeah. one thing and then pointing. And they were like, see, it didn't focus. But that was not the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem was like you set the camera up, you're filming yourself, and the camera literally just starts starts looking at other stuff. It's like bored with your conversations. The H5 is like, oh, this guy's accent. I cannot take it. I cannot take it anymore. So, I'm just going to look at the background now. Yeah. yeah. So every test I did, and I read it like manual to make sure I understand everything before I talk about it. Because I thought uh, a camera, a Micro Four Thirds camera on my channel at back then it is a big deal. So I have to know what I'm saying. I cannot make any mistakes. I read it. I, I did my tests and everything. And the lens I had had a different problem. So everything was terrible. And people said, get A6500. And I knew back then A6500 had the rolling shutter problem. What I didn't know was how big of a deal a rolling shutter is. But at a, at a setup like mine, it's not a big deal at all. I'm just sitting and talking. Like I'm not, I'm not filming racing cars or anything. So I ended up returning GH5 and uh, buying A6500 and I was mind blown. I started walking from the kitchen all the way to the end of the living room where A6500 is and I'm in focus no matter what settings I'm in. So at that point, <laughs> something clicked so good with Sony. Like everything with their with how they approach the because people were telling me no one uses autofocus amateurs use autofocus and I and I was thinking that's not the case in a YouTube world I I cannot be without autofocus then from a sixty five hundred I slowly start switch I switched to a seven R three right yeah, yes. that one yeah, that one had uh, phase detect autofocus. Yeah. Uh, compared to the A7S II, which was a better video camera, but it didn't have good autofocus. Yeah. That and an A7R4. And then I bought one more because I loved it so much. And 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 now here we are with almost. <laughs> yeah, the S, the S3, the FX3, the yeah. A7 IV. Yeah. All that. I don't have FX3. I have zero reasons. Zero. I'm telling <laughs> this to myself when I listen back to this podcast. Dude, listen. You have zero. You don't need that camera. But I. What's I your main? What is I'm your sorry. main camera right now? Then. It is A1, and. Um, Why did they put a, a flip screen on that one? For me. They were kind enough because I I don't want flip out screen for the home setup. Okay. I re especially with the overhead camera, uh, where so I can so this I really don't like with the overhead camera. With yeah. the tilt screen, it just tilts up like this. Uh -huh. You can see it in the podcast, but I'm making gestures with my hands. Uh, <laughs> if you're watching the video, yeah. Uh, that's a lot easier, especially on sure. the gimbal and stuff like that. Uh, and on the, the Edelcron stuff, the mm -hmm. tilt screen is a lot easy. So I'm in the minority, I know, no, but yeah. I'm very happy with the tilt screen. I know Gerald is an A1 user as well now. Having mm -hmm. 8K, are you shooting 8K and editing on a 4K timeline and using that as a crop in or? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, sometimes I'm releasing in 8K. I'm. I want to switch to full 8K, but the memory cards are not big enough, especially with me when I have the language barrier and when I have the the, the block. Like, I, oh, how do I say this in English, you know? The the camera is rolling. I got to stop and then, you know. That's true. It's a little so, okay. more work. Yeah. That's I can't imagine. Another thing I liked about Z9, that gigantic CF Express cards. Oh, mm -hmm. my God, shoot in 8K all you want. <laughs> you still have space. That's awesome. Yeah. Is it tempting for you to want to switch to the to the Z9? You seem to really love it. Um. Well, I'm way too deep in the Sony now with all the lenses and everything. And as much as I love, I loved Nikon. I loved it. 
But as soon as I switch back to the Sony camera, I go between the menus with my eyes closed. And that's that familiarity is is insane to me. I, I feel so comfortable. I know where everything is and then ch -ch -ch it's set up yeah. and I can start shooting. <laughs> and do you feel like the color issues that everybody seemed to have two, three years ago have been solved now with the newer color science? Yes. I I like the colors a lot on Sony cameras now. And but with I feel like with Sony it still requires a little more maybe touching. I have my presets ready, so I drop them and then everything is fine. With Nikon, I didn't need to do anything. Just drop the Z9 LUT and it looked really good. Yeah, I'm shooting this on the C70 right now and I've found the last year that I've been using the Canon, it's, you know, you get a little spoiled with the Canon stuff because it's just, it's so easy to make the colors look good. Yeah. Um, and it, that still seems to be the case, but I do feel like Sony has, has gotten to a, a, a point now where the A7S III and the, the A7 IV and the A1 and even the ZV1 has just great colors straight out of the box. Even with, yeah. without the, you know, not even shooting log, if you just shoot in the, they now have this, uh, the standard mode, the standard, uh, was it standard video profile or profile? I don't know. It's not the picture profile. It's like a creative style, I think is what it's called. So you turn yeah. picture profile off and then you go to the creative style and you set it to standard and you turn the sharpness down and maybe the contrast down a little bit, but just like the baked in colors look really pleasing to me now. So a beginner yeah. can, can pick up one of these cameras and, and get good footage. That's true. Also, a Cinetone is just... Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course. I forgot about that one. What about phones? Obviously, you're the iPhone Doe channel, so <laughs> a lot of iPhone-related stuff. Um, I mean, we're kind of in the mid-cycle here with the iPhone 13. Um, I personally ha own the 12 Pro. I didn't see a huge reason to upgrade. I, I'm very satisfied with the 12. Mm -hmm. My wife, however, got the 13. And I did a, a video shoot the other day on my phone and then my battery died and so I or my my storage filled up so I then grabbed her phone and filmed the rest of it on hers and that was like the perfect a b test because it was just a talking head of me shot on an iPhone and when I went from the 12 to the 13 like all of a sudden the skin tones and the color science immediately like changed and got better I was really impressed with just straight out of the box something happened with going from 12 to 13, like it's less blue. There was a little bit more contrast in it that felt a little bit more natural. Um, the sensor's bigger. Yeah. Again, we're, we're in another good spot here with mobile phones. Do you think we'll ever get to a point where you'll be shooting your reviews on a, on a phone instead of a full frame camera? <laughs> no, I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon because yeah. they can, they, the second they can, perfect the artificial background blur and stuff like that maybe they if they find a way to take care of hair and the the little you know corners of stuff maybe but still they have a lot of ways to go i feel like there's a very big difference also with a with a a7s3 you shoot and then you come home and if something looks a little blown up you have a lot of information there you can dial it down and and you still can uh, save it, but uh, I start using the phones. Let's say if I'm reviewing a camera and I'm out there in Venice Beach and I see something, I just take out my phone and I film it there and I talk to the phone as well. So I record my what I'm, what I'm saying and the footage just on the phone that is in my hand. And that started working really well with iPhone 12 and it's, uh, it goes on with 13. Uh, and I'm very happy. It's a really great camera to add a little bit um, amateur look to it, if, if you know if if that makes sense. Because like everything's shot with the really good cameras, everything looks really good with the depth of field and everything. And then and then there's there are a couple of shots where you're just I I did this a lot with the with the Nikon as well. I went to Venice Beach and I'm shooting the pier, and the camera is all set up. And I just shot that footage with the phone, explaining what I'm shooting, how I'm shooting it. 
and and I feel like that added a lot of soul to the video. So it's it's really good, and I'm very happy with these with these phone phones. And um, yeah, I have no complaints. I'm preparing uh, a, a review that's like six months later video. Oh, perfect! And I'm yeah. very excited. Yeah. The thing that I would love to see changed is uh, some way to get footage off of the phone faster. I think that's... Can you believe it? <laughs> I think that's the number one thing that, like, obviously we've been begging for, like, better codecs, and now we've got the ProRes codec, which is awesome that it, we can do that on these uh, on these phones. That's actually kind of mind-blowing that that's even possible. But because of that... Now everybody is really understanding how bad it is with the USB 2 speed with the lightning. So can you believe it? <laughs> so what do you think about that? Should should they go to USB C? Is there a way to do this wirelessly? Or I don't lightning think so. too, whatever. Put us in another box. I don't care. But just sure. let us transfer the files faster. It's it's hilariously like everything else about this phone is crazy good everything is really good i'm very happy with everything everything you do on it works great and then if you want to shoot progress video then you got to make sure you have time to transfer it because that's going to take forever <laughs> i was trying to uh, think like imagine if there was a real production using those and you'd really have to have at least like five phones because you could just shoot all day on it the file sizes are massive so you mm -hmm. need like a one terabyte for each phone you hand it off to a dit and then they just plug <laughs> it in and just let it sit <laughs> overnight because it takes five hours to dump the footage you know so you, you then go to the next phone and fill that one up and then dump that overnight you know like it's it's not a practical solution so hopefully whether it's yeah. lightning 2 or USB C with uh even just USB 3.1 speed would be better. But I mean, obviously Thunderbolt, like the yeah. iPad Pro would be awesome. Yeah. Um, so maybe, I, I feel like it would make sense almost for the iPhone 14 Pro models to have the same connection as the I, iPad Pro. Um, I that agree. kind of, I feel like that makes sense because yeah. most people don't care about that still. They, they only use that plug to charge it. So um Maybe get rid of the plug, go to MagSafe on the 14 mini and the 14 and then do, you know, Thunderbolt USB-C on Pro and Pro Max. That'd be awesome. <laughs> I agree. With the with the 12, the difference between the regular 12 mini and 12 versus 12 Pro and 12 Pro Max was different. Even 12 Pro and 12 Pro Max are different phones, with the, especially with the telelens and stuff like that. So with 13... They made pros more pros and left the 13 mini and 13 a little further back. Com Just more if normal. You put them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you com if you put them on top of each other, comparing how they were mm -hmm. different from each other. So with 14, well, I'm pretty sure they already designed and everything is finalized already. They're probably of thinking course. about 16 or 17 right now, but <laughs> we really need so. But this is kind of how Apple works. It's that um, they they bring something and then something is missing, and then that they fulfill that, and then we go like yeah, and then they add something, and then we realize oh to use that now we need something else. There's this yeah. always chasing going on, and this lightning port with the ProRes is an issue. It's not possible to use ProRes. I was trying to make a video because it's not easy to show what ProRes really does in a video. Uh, so I was trying my best and I found a way to show it and I was really excited. And by the time I was getting the footage out of my phone, everyone released, <laughs> you know that race we have sometimes? Yeah, oh yeah, of course. Everyone released their videos. I was like, ah, oh, okay, never mind. Never mind. Yeah. Forget it. Can we talk about that? The um, There seems to be this race, uh, I like to call it the rat race, of the YouTube uh, NDA game. Yeah. And you are definitely a part of that race <laughs> because I am. Yeah. along with many others, uh, your videos go live at the exact same time when a new product comes out. Mm -hmm. And it, maybe as an outsider, people may think, oh, they're all competing to get views. And it, par that's partially true, but I would argue that every single person that posts, 
you're friends with. So it's like, it's an, it is a friendly thing and it's not even about competing with each other. It's about just being first to market and kind of putting it out there for your audience who are already subscribers who are watching all your content, but then obviously taking advantage of the obvious fact that when a new phone comes out, there's a lot of news about it. So people are searching for that product on YouTube, like right away, as soon as somebody finds out, oh, there's a new iPhone, let me learn about it. They go to YouTube, they search iPhone 14, hit enter, and then boom, that's where you get a lot of new subscribers because you get all these people who are discovering you for the first time. So you, you just want to get it out to get discovered. It's not to like beat I Justine because you guys are like best friends. So it's like, you, it's not a competition in that way, but it's a race to get it done as quickly as possible. Can you share just yeah. your, <laughs> about it's that? It's absolutely like not, it's not a race at all. And uh, it's all, it's all like something we do all together. It's to me, it's actually a lot of fun. I know some people complained because suddenly their timeline is filled up with the iPhone videos and stuff like that. But the way I see it, and the and there are a lot of people who agrees with me, is that we all have our takes on the products. We all have stuff that we care that are different from each other. And and people start watching my video and get get information about one thing and then they go to Justine's video and get information about something else. And from there they go to someone else's video and get information about something else. With the drones, the same thing. Like everyone goes somewhere else. Everyone flies in a different place. Everyone flies in a different wind and everyone's ex uh, experience is different. So you get a lot of information. It's like asking your friends about a phone. You, I ask you, and then I ask her, and I ask the other person, and get different people's opinions. And all all that information gives you an idea about what the device, what to expect from a device. In that sense, I actually really love it, and I don't ever see it as competition. I know some people like try to release maybe an hour early. Oh, I didn't understand. It's the, oh, it's Pacific time. I didn't understand that, you know? <laughs> but. Um, in the end, this is not like one shot game. This is a marathon and it's, we're here for a real long time. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. TikTok. You've, you've been playing around with TikTok. You seem to like it. What's your thoughts on short form, uh, YouTube shorts and TikTok content? Do you have a strategy or are you just kind of playing around with it? What are your thoughts on it? I think YouTube is dying. <laughs> no. It's not dying, but YouTube is established now. YouTube is what it is, and it's losing its sparkly um, uh, days. <laughs> and and we're transferring to you uh, TikTok. I'm barely, I I'm barely on YouTube, and my job is on YouTube, and I'm constantly on TikTok. And on TikTok, you see something you like, you tap on it, you double tap it, and then you see more stuff that you like. So it sucks you in in a really nice way, like science, music, technology. It's all the stuff I'm interested in. And my front page is filled with them, for you pages filled with them. And I love it so much. And I'm getting used to creating content for TikTok. And um, I, think, I think it's a great way to consume content. It's really good. It's really fast. Yeah. Uh, concentrated. The algorithm is so good on TikTok that pretty much now my my personal TikTok, when I go to the For You page, it's just every video is something that I'm interested in. And in my case, it's it's just comedy. It's just funny clips and silly things. And um, every once in a while, tech-related stuff will pop up here and there. Yeah. Um, obviously, over the last couple of weeks, it seems like a lot of conversation has been around the way that TikTok pays creators and how little they pay creators, even people who are getting millions and millions of views. Obviously, YouTube is, like you said, more established, so it's a better place to make a living. Yeah. But I, I think if you really think about where the eyeballs are going and where people are watching stuff, it's on TikTok. And maybe if you just kind of ride the wave of TikTok over the next five years, as a creator and just grow your content there while obviously making a living on YouTube, I think 
they'll figure it out eventually. And there probably will be some way to make a living on TikTok, I would imagine. Well, people made living on Instagram and Instagram wasn't paying anyone anything at all. It was just a different um, economy. You would get paid in a different way. And that can apply to TikTok. And also on top of that, TikTok pays a little bit. And so, so you can make a living out of it. But it's not the same system as YouTube and it cannot be the same system as YouTube. First of all, there's no space for the ads on the sides and stuff like that. And the format is completely different. So it's it makes so much sense to me. I saw Hank Green complain about it. I was really surprised why he was complaining about it because that's how it's built. That is the that is the platform. And that's maybe why a lot of people like it, because they don't have to wait for YouTube changed the mid rolls. And I did didn't even tell us. One day I upload a video and, and someone said, why did you put, I don't know, like four mid-roll ads? And I'm like, I have no idea. I'm not doing anything. So it was, <laughs> so YouTube do, does all that stuff. There's nothing like that on TikTok. It's it's fresh, it's new. The, the, the younger people are there. Um, it seems like when you find the right audience, it's it's a little bubble that you can be in. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's a real nice platform. Totally, and as a as a musician yourself and then myself too, I, I don't know if you saw the parody videos I did, but they performed really well on uh, TikTok and versus on YouTube. You know, they they really kind of blew up on TikTok. So, if it's music related, it does well there. Yeah, there's one TikTok so. I did. Um, I stitched someone's video where we're just staring at the screen. Mm-hmm at um, 600,000 views. I'm, I'm not doing anything. I'm just staring at the camera for 30 seconds or something. <laughs> and th there's people, I feel like uh, a lot of people who don't understand this stuff will see, hear that and be like, why? That doesn't make any sense. It's like, what do you mean why? It It's funny. It added value to somebody's life through entertainment. And there, there can be a dollar sign attached to that because you're yeah. actually, even if it's only 15 seconds, you've added a smile or, or entertainment to somebody for 15 seconds. And yes, that's not a 10 minute YouTube video, but there's value there. And I think um, just we're just we're just at the beginning stages of TikTok's growth. And obviously YouTube is, is desperately trying to do it with uh, YouTube shorts and they may be, you know, able to figure it out there, but I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. I, I, YouTube is my home. That's why I critic it the the harshest because I I want them I want my platform to do great stuff and uh, but I'm seeing YouTube is becoming uh, MySpace. It's <laughs> it's not it's never gonna go away, but mm -hmm. uh, YouTube had so many scars. It has so many controversies that. The, the the protection they had to put themselves in is killing. I never discovered anyone on YouTube. There was one video. Um, I was I was gonna make a video about Insta360 Go, and I wanted to see what other people did. And I discovered this guy. I have never seen this guy, never. And we know everyone. This is our this is our life. Our life is YouTube, Twitter, TikTok. It's, we are we live online basically. Never seen this guy creates incredible. Now, see, I don't even remember his name because it's gone now. He had an amazing video, amazing lighting, amazing storytelling, and everything. Mm -hmm. Never seen him, never even once on TikTok. <laughs> every day I'm discovering, every day I'm following someone else on YouTube. I don't even remember the last time I subscribed to anyone new. I don't even remember <laughs> discovering anyone new. <laughs> It's all Sniper You're, Wolf now. <laughs> it's all Sniper Wolf and Mr. Beast, that's for sure. Um, oh, man. Yeah, crazy. Okay, that's a that's a hot take right there, man. I yeah, love it. Yeah, but I understand it because they have to you be do. safe. They they got into so much trouble. I understand it because they're, uh, they're probably yeah. scared now. If you could change one thing about YouTube, if you had like a magic wand and you could change one thing, you could you know talk to the CEO and make mm -hmm. a change, what would it be? 
it will be the punishment when you take a break. I hate that thing. It's YouTube's job to find the audience for my video. It's not my job to, I mean, I, I, I would do it, but it's not my job to learn the algorithm games, create fake giveaways and ask people to like a video and like play all those tricks and tips and tricks. It's my job to bring quality to YouTube and it's YouTube's job to find who will watch my video. So if I take a break, let me take a break. Just, just push my video to the right people, put it in their face instead of putting 10 sniper wolf videos, like put us like, it's a very valuable spot in the main, main page and you're giving like 10 spots to one creator, but we're here too. There's so many of us that try to do good and we can all make this platform so much better. Don't be, I mean, I understand them being scared of the uh, controversies, but we've been here for more than 10 years and we're, we're the good guys. We just want to do good stuff. So yeah, hundred yeah. percent. You know, it would be kind of cool if in the YouTube studio, if there was like a take a break button, it was like, okay, I'm going to select a one week break. You hit take a break. And then that initiates some sort of boosting algorithm thing. Although people would just take advantage of that and just always use it. But, uh, I don't know. It's just like a it's a thought. It's not, maybe you yeah. get like maybe you get two vacations a year or something that you could just push a button and then it kind of like knows that you're not going to upload for the next two weeks and then it just kind of like does some magic with the videos you've already posted. I don't know. Yeah. Well, Farouk, thank you so much for coming on the Golden Hour podcast. Thank you, Dave. <laughs>